Spain's Prime Minister calls for a return to normality in Catalonia as the region prepares yet again to vote. But after the Catalan dream of an independent homeland was thwarted by government leaders in Madrid, what does the future hold? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Deri Nabugeda. Decision Day is fast approaching in Catalonia. Thursday's snap regional election was ordered by Spain's government leaders in Madrid after Catalans voted for independence in a referendum two months ago. As voters go to the poll again, what's the mood there now? We'll speak to our guests in a moment, but first, Carl Penhall reports from Barcelona on the Catalans against independence who are making their voices heard. She's emerging as the great hope of the anti-independence cause. How are you feeling in How are you feeling in S? Are you confident? How are you feeling? That's Ines Arrimadas, a former lawyer who moved to Catalonia from southern Spain a decade ago. As regional leader of the Citizens Party, she's promising a Catalonian spring to defeat politicians pushing for separation. A vote for the Citizens' Party is a vote to reform Spain, but not to break it up. She wants to reform tax laws and tackle corruption, but above all, her party vows Catalonia must remain part of Spain and the European Union. In the latest opinion poll, Ciudadans or the Citizens' Party is running neck and neck with the biggest pro-independence party. But if unionists like Arimadas hope to control the Catalan parliament, they'll have to build a coalition. Arimadas' pro-Spanish message finds a ready echo in this crowd. We're fed up of so many separatists and the separatist movement. You can't break up Spain. That's impossible. There are many more of us who are opposed to independence, but we kept our mouths shut. But the time is here and they can no longer keep us silent. Draped in Spanish flags, these school friends are too young to vote, but want to take part anyway. I think we have more doors open to the world if Catalonia is part of Spain, and that way we have access to the rest of Europe. Government leaders in Madrid have organized extra security to protect unionist candidates from opposing separatist groups in the campaign for the election on December the 21st. For now, Arimada seems relaxed, surrounded by her loyalists, and confident she can pull in the votes. Carl Penhall, Al Jazeera, Barcelona, Spain. Well, Catalonia's former president, Carles Puigdemont, and his supporters have held a major rally ahead of next week's SNAP regional poll. Puigdemont addressed Friday's campaign event in Barcelona via video from Brussels, where he fled following the region's unilateral declaration of independence in October. And addressing his supporters, this is what he said. If we want an independent state, let's vote and let's vote like an independent state. And therefore, let's defeat pessimism, defeat the darkness of Article 155, and let's help expel the fear from our streets. So if we just take a closer look at what happened recently, when the Catalan parliament declared outright independence in October, leaders of Spain's government in Madrid cracked down hard, arguing they were upholding the constitution. The Spanish government fired the leaders of the Catalan government and dissolved the regional parliament in Barcelona. In a first for Spain, the Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy invoked Article 155 of the Constitution, therefore imposing direct control. With no international recognition and little sympathy from neighbors in the European Union, the secessionists weren't able to implement their breakaway. Let's uh, bring in our guests. Uh, joining us uh, for this discussion from Madrid, we have uh, Miguel Anjo Murado, who's a political analyst and contributor to the New York Times and The Guardian from Barcelona. Sonia Andos, a lecturer at the University of Barcelona. Also from Madrid, Daniel Gazcon, the editor of the Spanish edition of Letras Libres, or Free Letters magazine. Thanks for joining us. 
on Inside Story. Welcome to you all. Daniel, the ousted president of Catalonia, he's in exile, fighting extradition. The former vice president is behind bars, accused of rebellion and sedition. Other officials are either in jail or then they're out of Barcelona. So this is very, very unprecedented. How unprecedented is it for an election to be held under these circumstances? Well, I think it's, as you say, it's very, it's very unprecedented because, uh, for instance, Article 155 was, was never um, um, put in practice. No? So the situation is, is in general, uh, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented. And I think the, the attempt is to go back to, to normal politics. But obviously, it's a, it's a very strange campaign with, with this, this uh, self-exile in, in Brussels uh, and with uh, candidates in, in prison. I think this um, makes that this a very powerful and a very emotional uh, and, and a typical campaign. Miguel, is it going to be possible to go back to normal politics, as Daniel is saying? The, uh, the ousted leader, the, the former leader, Puigdemont, is saying that these are absolutely abnormal uh, conditions. He's right. Well, he's right in, the, in that, that these are abnormal conditions. Uh, as to going back to normality, of course, that is what was promised by the central government to all the Spaniards and to the supporters of, uh, of the pro-Spain position in Catalonia, that these elections would sort things out. Um, well, the assumption was that the nationalists, after having failed in their bid for independence, would become disappointed, um, would not be perhaps even willing to vote in an election that was called by the central government. Well, but that hasn't been the case. Uh, to the surprise of many, the truth is that the nationalists remain more or less where they were. The, the, the strength they have, according to the polls, and if polls are not mistaken, of course, is basically the same force they had. Now, the new aspect here is that there is, uh, uh, well, something new. The, the, those who oppose independence, the, the, the pro-Spain party, so to speak, which is represented actually by three different parties, um, ha is now energized and uh, could perhaps um, change things in this election. But honestly, if, from what we see in the polls, I don't think that is very likely. It's possible, but it's unlikely. The most likely scenario is that we will go back more or less to where we were. Of course, lots of things have happened in between, but uh, the nationalists will probably have an edge, will probably have, if not an absolute majority, they will be able to form a government, and, well, um, we will be back to a very a situation of conflict very soon. Uh, before we get into the polls, actually, in your individual prediction, Sonia, you're at the heart of it. You're in Barcelona. Just uh, tell us what impact the absence of these leaders is having on this election campaign and, and the days leading up to the election. I actually quite agree with Miguel and Daniel because it's a very abnormal elections in many senses. But in particular, for the pro-independence uh, voters, it's obviously a very, very strange situation. As you said, many consider the Catalan politicians in Brussels to be in exile, but definitely they are pending um, trial. And then part of uh, the candidates are also in jail. Um, here it feels that we've been in a roller coaster of emotions, as uh, Miguel, I think, was saying. It's a very emotional election because uh, things ha many things have happened in this past months. Every week changes a little bit, perceptions and vote intention, and the polls are uh, coming up and down. So it's very interesting for us political analysts, but it's very hard for a, a normal average uh, voter to make its calculation. So what is that your said, prediction then? The recent polling that I have seen, at least from El País, is saying mm -hmm. that the uh, the pro-unity and the pro-independence camps are really running neck and neck at this point. Yes, so that is because um, I think Miguel was just saying for the October the 1st, only people who were pro-independence mainly went to vote as it was only organized by one part. And now we're going to have a more mobilized uh, pro-remain uh, sector of voters. But it seems not just El País, but the three, four main polls that we follow here in Spain, it seems it's not clear at all. And it's going to be very difficult. There's not going to be any single clear winner, but it's going to be very difficult to create a coalition that can uh, govern because creating a majority, it seems it's going to be very hard. So I'm afraid, as Miguel was saying, we are going to live, unfortunately, in Catalonia in a Groundhog Day, and we're just going to go back into the loop 
to the first uh, position where it is we have a conflict here that needs to be solved and until the main actors don't address the, the background conflict um, elections are quite useless. I'm Daniel, afraid. what do you what do you think? Are we going to be looking at weeks of haggling between different parties trying to form a, a coalition government after this vote takes place on Thursday? Will no one win an outright majority? Um, yes, I think uh, there are many things that, that we don't know. It seems that the two the two blocks are more or less in, in equal side, and it's going to be very difficult to to form to form a government. I. I think we we can be we can be looking not only at weeks but maybe months of a negotiation. And I think it's it's going to be very very hard to to create this. There's also now in the campaign differences between the the two main blocs, uh, the the nationalist or pro independent side, and also in the constitutionalist side. So I, I think it's. Um, the, what, what we what we can figure out about the results now is mostly about the difficulty of, of forming a, a government now and and, and of um, so I think as, as Sonia was saying that in, in some senses we are going to go back or we could be getting back to the to the first position uh, Miguel but there is another party here isn't there a seventh party and that is the left wing uh, Podesta uh, Podemos excuse me Podemos party does that party then hold the balance of power how key is that? I mean, the, the leaders of the party are certainly uh, playing it up. Well, that is that is a, a key point. And when I was saying that the nationalists have a slight edge in the polls, uh, I meant it not just in uh, quantitative terms and the fact that they have a little bit more votes, according to most polls, not all polls. There are polls that said that the unionists are ahead. But uh, I was also referring to this to the fact that even if the nationalists do not succeed in securing uh, an absolute majority, say they are short of it for, by several seats, they can still form a government because there's this party, which is known in, in, in Spain as Podemos, but is known in Catalonia as Catalonia, uh, uh, Catalonia in Comú. This party is a leftist party um, it's not pro-independence, though there are people, there are leaders and certainly many of its voters who are pro-independence. And this party will not vote for a, for a pro-independence government, but it will not oppose it either, probably. Of course, this is an assumption, but I think it's a safe assumption that if the nationalists present a candidate for the presidency, they will abstain, and that will give the nationalists the government. But here's so, yes, the they thing, are though, even if they sense. do win votes, Miguel, even if they do win votes, does that necessarily mean that that translates into seats? Yes, uh, it's, it's the most likely scenario, because um, if the polls are correct, and again, of course, we have to be very always cautious with this, because polls sometimes are widely off the mark, but if the polls are correct, yes, the nationalists either will have an absolute majority, in that case there's no question, they will form a government, uh, or they will be short of a, of a majority, but not by much. Uh, in that case, yes, the abstention will give them the government. And that would be really a problem for the central government, for Mr. Mariano Rajoy, the Prime Minister, because obviously the promise of these elections was, uh, from the point of view of the Spanish government, that this will sort out all this problem. Well, not only that will not happen, but actually things will be in a way worse because, as we all know, the, the, the likely precedent of these uh, new nationalist governments will be either uh, Mr. Puigdemont, who is, uh, well, who is uh, um, in, in, in Belgium, he, he has escaped the action of Spanish justice or in exile according to his, to his use of the term, or uh, perhaps even worse, uh, Mr. Oriol Junqueras, who is in jail. So this will cause an international uproar and it will be difficult to manage for the government. Not impossible, I think they, they have ways to, to sort it out, but, um, but it's not what was expected, certainly. It, Sonia, give us a sense of, you know, you often hear of how polarized Catalonia has become over this issue of separating and secessionism. Give us a sense of how it is uh, today, on the days leading up to this election. I think, well, we're definitely polarized. I would lie if I said we aren't. But I think tension has gone a little bit lower this last week. I think there is a bit of uh, tiredness on both sides. Obviously, each side has the most uh, pro supporters who are super excited about uh, going for elections and then definitely either 
pro proving that uh, pro independence is winning or proving that pro uh, unionism is is winning, right? But the majority of the people, you know, we we've been having many, for example, many public demonstrations or people were uh, banging um, kitchen pots for for months. This has gone lower this last two months. I think the pro independence sector uh, voters were a bit lost in translation the last weeks. Uh, there were some um, statements from the leaders saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that, or maybe in this sense we were not 100% fair to the population or to the people. Then also um, the imposement of 155 article has been quite strong, not only at a political level, but it has affected other levels, like, for example, university, research centers not receiving transfers. It is creating bureaucratic um, relentless, at least. So there seems to be a kind of tiredness more than anything else. But still in the background, everyone is hoping for a solution, which I, I am very sorry to say, I really don't think these elections will be a solution at all. When they were, uh, when we had the call for elections from Mr. Rajoy, I already was very critical about it because I really think this is not going to bring a solution to the independence or not independence uh, conflict. And without solving that conflict, I'm very ex skeptical about how are we supposed to continue governing other issues such as social issues, educational issues, economic issues, if we have half of the population still claiming we right. want at least a referendum, so it's very difficult. We'll get back to the the point you raised on solutions in just a moment, but Daniel, let me ask you this. For the pro-independence groups, if they uh, come out and they lose the majority that they've had since 2015, how big a setback is that going to be for this push for uh, independence and uh, breaking away from Madrid? Um. I, I I don't know because one I think one thing that the pro independence camp has been very skillful to do is uh, to to spin everything that happens and to and to make it uh, something good for the for for their intentions. No, I think um, we could see maybe a, a defeat in in votes, which was what happened also in 2015. Uh, probably not in seats, but. Um, I I don't think the I think also as, as Sonia was saying, the logical of the of the campaign makes it more difficult to think about this um, what has happened in the in the last few months if, if you are a, a person who believes in independence no because obviously you are now you are thinking about the next election about the this this power struggle and um, the the way you are you are facing the the other parties no and. So you, it's not maybe the best moment to evaluate uh, those mistakes that were, I think, clearly made uh, in the in this time. If you if you think about the the results of of the unilateral uh, bid for independence, uh, Miguel, at the time of the vote uh, in October, we know that the EU kind of was watching very closely the situation that was unfolding, but generally it did tend to side with Madrid. Uh, when it came to this issue. The EU doesn't have a mandate to intervene, but do you think that there's something going on uh, behind the scenes? Could the EU now be mediating in any way? And I, and I raise this issue because uh, I'll go back to Sonia in a moment because she was uh, talking about potential solutions. So does the EU have a solution? I don't think so. I think it's unlikely that the EU is uh, negotiating uh, behind the backs of the Spanish government. Certainly not, but even trying to influence the Spanish government at this point. Uh, this was the assumption uh, by the nationalists. They thought that Europe would step in, especially if there was violence, and there was some violence, police violence. I was there during the, during the, the referendum vote covering the story, and yes, there was indeed police violence. Uh, but um, this Europe is different. It's changed uh, in, a, in a matter of a couple of years. Um, it's a, this post-Brexit Europe, or Brexit Europe, actually, Brexit has not happened yet, is different. It's much more um, interested in preserving its unity, is much more keen on defending the, the member states. And of course, Spain is an important member state, is a member, is a Euro member, and, uh, and it's, a, it's an important part of the European Union. So, 
I think Mr. Rajoy uh, can count on the support of European Union all the way, except, of course, uh, in the circumstance that things spiral out of control, there is a huge economic crisis that could threaten the euro area, that there's violence, but I think that is uh, almost impossible now. This could have happened um, in the past uh, few weeks um, when there was the Declaration of Independence, namely, that was the key moment of tension in which things could have gone very, very wrong. It didn't happen. The nationalists, for some reasons that have not really been explained uh, still by them, they, they really let it go. They declared independence, but they didn't follow up. They didn't do anything about it. So there was no violence. That is a good thing. Um, but that was the only opportunity I think they had of bringing Europe into, this, into the picture. I don't think, I don't think Europe will, will have a say on this. Sonia, you spoke of solutions. Clearly, there are differences between Barcelona and Madrid. Um, do you think some sort of deal is going to be reached? What is the way forward here? Um, no, I'm not positive and I'm not very hopeful about it right now. I agree with Mila, um, Antra and uh, Daniel that many people thought, or the pro-independence movement at least, tried to build this narrative that the European Union would never allow um, uh, Catalonia to uh, face a very dramatical, um, uh, I don't know, uh, control or dramatical effects from Madrid. And definitely many, many people were deceived when after police uh, brutality and um, all the images that we have all seen, um, the European Union was very low or very mild in its critique to Spain. That said, as a professor of international relations, I keep telling in class, the European Union is a union of states. And therefore, one thing is what you can expect and the other is what you can legitimate hope for. So I think it's very logical from a state's perspective, if it's a club of states, we're going to protect state members. Right. And therefore, we're going to just support state sovereignty. Okay. That said, the, U the European Union tries to send this message to the world that we are the leaders of individual rights, political rights, and uh, all these uh, rights that you cannot see in other parts of the world. And that's why I think many people in Catalonia expected the European Union to be stronger about Catalan rights to decide on whether what they want as a political model and uh, to, to call off or to tell off Spain about how um, the government is dealing with this crisis. For the sake of time, Daniel, final word to you. Tell me how you see things unfolding after uh, the vote this week. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I think the, the elections are, are a good thing in even with all these problems that we are that we are talking about, and uh, and I'm sure this this one they won't lead to an immediate solution, no. But I think um, could be it could be a, it could be a, a start, and I hope that um, a normal way of, res of solving this uh, conflict politically is, is reached. Uh, what I think is that there are many different points of view, and nobody knows what what would be the the best the best route to do a, a constitutional reform that. I think this is what we will finally need, but uh, for that uh, we need um, a disposition to, to debate uh, honestly and clearly and, and also with a... So, with so a bit does this election then on Thursday set the stage for that? Does it uh, start a conversation that needs to be started? Yes, that, that's, that's what I, I hope, that, that, that it will happen and that we can see more clearly how uh, opinions are, no? because we, we are going to see like the, 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 the photograph of what, what happens after. And I, I know I should be pessimistic, but I keep uh, a little bit of optimism. It's good to have some optimism. So on that note, we'll leave it there. We thank you very much for joining us, Daniel Dascon, Sonia Andols, and Miguel Anjo Morado. Thank you. And thank you for watching. You can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From myself and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for joining us. Goodbye for now.